Hi, thanks for stopping by Next Level Carpentry. I'm in the middle of this custom box newel project, and while I was making these caps with a double dome on them, I was using my favorite sanding block to true up the curves after making these post caps with a special router fixture that you'll see in another video. And I got to thinking that I generally take these sanding blocks for granted, but they're invaluable for certain applications in the shop. And I assumed that there'd be a hundred videos showing how to make this sanding block that holds a durable 3 by 21 inch sanding belt firmly to a block of wood with a simple wedge to keep it in place. But a quick search told me that no one's really covered the process for making these simple and effective sanding blocks. There's some similar ones, but I like the fact that a simple wedge shoved into one end of this sanding block holds the belt firm and tight and snug to the block of wood, which allows for precision sanding on custom parts like this. And it's also useful for flattening parts where an orbital sander or a smaller handheld sander tends to tip and round off the curves. So if you want to see the process I use for making a batch of the best blocks for demanding sanding, stick around and I'll show you how. It doesn't take a lot of material to build the best blocks for demanding sanding. And it's a great opportunity to use up nice looking scraps you have laying around the shop just looking for a purpose in life. And that's the case with this mesquite. It was left over from a project I had. So I took random scraps, flattened the face, and then ran them through the thickness planer. And they ended up a 32nd over 3 quarters of an inch thick, somewhere 3 quarters to 13 16 Makes for a nice handy size of a block. You can make it any thickness you want by compensating with steps later on. But like I said, this is a, a fat three quarters of an inch. That's a nice thickness. I also planed up a piece of a contrasting color wood for the belt tightening wedges. I think a contrasting color is nice. That's not essential. But the important thing is that it's the same thickness as the sanding blocks. And then it's nice to have it big enough so that the wedges can be cut extra long fit for snugness and then trim to length rather than starting off with something that's exactly three and a half inches and having to make that work. So I'll take the pieces that are milled to the same thickness, straighten an edge and then rip them and plane them again so they end up at exactly three inches wide with planed edges on both sides. Once you've got all the pieces cut to the exact three inch width, just rough cut a square end on each of the pieces for the rounded end of the sanding block. The main body of the block ends up about nine inches. So I like to go 10, 10 and a half, 11 inches on the rough square cut. And with the material I'm using, I'm basically just making sure I'm cutting off the bad spots using the prettiest section of the wood. And in the case of these longer pieces, cutting them so that I can get two blocks out of each one. I'm just gonna Put these at 11. And because this has a pretty end on it, I'm going to use that for the square end on this guy. This will be close enough here. And with the rough cuts laid out, I can tape these together for gang cutting. These ends are staggered because this particular one needs a little more cut off it at this stage. With all the pieces taped and gang cut with a square end, it's time to cut an angle on the other end. And the angle gives the best wedging action for holding the sanding belts tight on the block. Three degrees is an ideal angle. And for a decent sized wedge, use nine and an eighth inches for the long point 
of that angle, right on the edge of the piece of tape, don't you know it? And then I'll mark that three degree line for cutting on the miter box. And a little variance here isn't the end of the world because there's actually some variation in the precise length of a belt and how tight they'll wrap on the block. That can be made up with the taper of the wedge and then also by adding this slip layer on the angle later. And this piece can be thicker or thinner as can the wedges. So a nine and an eighth is a good starting point. And set that guy to three degrees. Some of that designer firewood I talk about. Boy, that mesquite's some fantastic wood. With the pieces gang cut to the exact same size, just break open the bundles and using a 3 8 roundover bit, route both faces of the square end. I put marks on the end of these blocks so I don't round over the angled end instead. Set the bit carefully to make as accurate of a half round end profile as you can get. This is pretty hard wood and a kind of a tired bit. So I've got a little burn on this side, but that's all right. I can clean that up with, guess what? A sanding block. Repeat that process for the square ends of all the blanks. Once the square ends of all the blocks have the bull nose profile on them, the next step is to add a thin layer of wood across the, the three degree cut end. The wedge action on that three degree slope is so strong that I found that the wedge actually sticks tighter than it needs to when it's laying on this end grain. This is a particularly hard wood, so maybe it's not such an issue, but because of past experience, I'm gonna go ahead and add a thin layer of straight grain wood on the end. So I'll cut two strips of a fat 16th of an inch off of this contrasting wood block. The edge of this block are right, it's smooth, and I'm just marking the plain surface. And this is a perfect case for using an expendable favorite push stick made of quarter inch melamine for pushing these two thin strips through. As luck would have it, I'll be able to get six pieces out of these two strips. So I've got the pencil mark, i.e. plain side, towards the fence. And I'm just gonna bump these guys over here to mark. Then I'll cut that at three degrees on the miter box. They won't be exact length, I'll trim the ends off after they're glued. Swing this three degrees the other direction. Not that it's all that important, but it'll help just a little bit. You could use a lot of things to glue these pieces on from wood glue to speed tape by fast cap. But I'm just going to use a little bit of CA glue with activator and I'll just spray the back faces of all these pieces, i.e. the side without a pencil mark on them, with the activator. So they're all done. Then line that piece up on the fence and use the Gorilla Super Glue for this part. I want a nice sturdy bond there, so I'm making sure I get it out to the edges, even though a couple dabs will more than do the job. The rip fence is locked in position. Everything's lined up, and I just need to get the ends close. I can trim them after it's on the block. So I'm just going to press that guy on and give it a good push. Count to ten. Think about happy thoughts. And it's done. Nothing to it. Stuck like crazy. Then I can quickly clean up the ends with the pull cut saw on the vise. And if I just had a sanding block, I could clean up those ends. And that's that. As I'm trimming up the last one of these, I'll go ahead and admit how silly it was to worry about trimming those at three degrees. Thought it was gonna matter, but this is so quick and easy. It was silly, oh well.
And working on this process kind of makes me think it's a chicken and egg sort of deal because how do you make a sanding block unless you have a sanding block? I'll use a sharpened putty knife, cool cabinet scraper to clean up a little bit of that CA glue on there. Ultimately, I'll sand these blocks down with a random orbit sander of all things. But getting that little bit of CA glue oozage off of there at this stage of the game will just make that sanding process easier later. Gets everything flushed up in short order where using the random orbit sander would just gum up the paper for a little bit and round the edge off. And I want that edge to be nice and crisp and sharp on the finished product. With those thin cross grain strips all glued on the blocks, the next and last real step for these is to make the wedges that hold the belts tight to the sanding block. They have to have a matching three degree taper to them to pull the belt tight and even. And working with small pieces deserves your utmost respect because they tend to require you to have fingers closer to spinning blades that bite. So I'll show you the process I use for making these wedges while minimizing the risk. And I'll start out with this contrasting wood block. It's plain the same thickness as all the sanding blocks, but right now it's longer than it is wide and I need it to be wider than it is long. So I'm just going to cut it about in half and it's important that the edges are parallel and the ends are square. And this is how I'll go about making the piece wider than it is long. And there's nothing magic about these dimensions or the way I'm going about this. If you have a bigger piece of scrap, you can go about it all different. If you already have a board that's wide enough, you don't have to go through this step. But the important part is to end up with the long grain on the piece that you're making wedges out of. It needs to be extra long and make plenty of it so you can hang on to these pieces. The exact taper will be the next step. I put plenty of glue on that joint because I don't want that coming apart in the next few steps here. By spraying activator on that glue that spilled onto the table, it just Turns into plastic and peels right off. So now I have this nice sturdy block, has a flat edge, two square sides, and the length of the pieces are noticeably wider than they need to be for the wedge on the sanding blocks. I switched the 3 8 inch roundover bit into this D-handled router just because I'm more comfortable using it for this process than freehanding it on the router table. If you've got a router table set up with a fence, that's definitely safer than going freehand on a router table, but I'm equally comfortable with the safety of this D-handled router process. I've got that bit set ever so slightly deep, so I'll back it off for the rest of these. And this is where having stock that's a little thicker than three quarters of an inch works nicely. If it's a little less than three quarters of an inch, then you get a funny seam here at the corner when you get into the full round over mode. If you want with a one inch thick piece instead of three quarter and use the half inch router bit, basically get the same result for a thicker block as well as doing the whole process to get a thinner block. But what I have here now is a blank with two bull nosed edges on it, straight side. At this point in the project, this kind of goes from science to art for figuring out how thick this wedge needs to be. All the factors up to this point, the exact length of the block, the thickness, the radius, the thickness of the little wood strip on there, the size of the particular belt you're using can change this noticeably. But all I'm going to do is take a 100 grit belt. This is fairly flexible as opposed to this gnarly thing that's stiff and hard to manage. But I'll slip the belt on here and put my finger in on the short point side of that angle and then pull it kind of tight. And with that set up, it's looking like about three quarter inch to the inside of that rounded curve. So on the block, I'll just mark three quarters of an inch. And then I'm going to actually downsize it a strong sixteenth of an inch. Because I want the wedge to come all the way out the other side a little bit when it's nice and snug and that'll allow trimming everything else. So from this shorter mark, I'll extend a three degree angle line. So that'll be a three degree cut line for this guinea pig wedge. So I'm 
setting the saw at three degrees, which should be pretty close to that pencil mark. I've got enough block over here to hang on to while this cut's being made. And I've got the flat edge of this block up against the fence. And there's a wedge. And now just take that wedge and slip it in on the fat side and tap it into place. And that belt is really stuck on there. And that's a little bit too skinny. I want the wedge to stick out here a half an inch or something like that, but then stop short on this side so that if I'm sanding into something, I don't have that wedge sticking out. So the next one, I'll make just a skosh wider so the taper tightens up sooner. So I'll mark the skinny end on the other side of the blank and then add a little bit to it for the pencil mark. And let's see how that flies. You can see the difference between wedge number one and wedge number two for thickness. It's pretty slight, but the difference on the sanding block is fairly significant because the wedge is short on this end and sticking out obviously way more on that end. And this will change from belt to belt also. So it's up to you to decide how long you want those wedges, how snug you want them to be, and where they stop when the belt is tight. I use this little tack hammer to drive the wedge out. Let's see what happens when I use a stiffer belt. I'm going to go back to number one. When it maybe goes right, just goes right about through. And number two is a good fit. So that gives you an idea of what size you want the wedges. All the factors and dimensions of building the block make the most difference right at this point. It's easy enough to sand this down a little bit to make the wedge narrower could always glue a thin piece on here, a piece of plastic laminate or who knows what on there to make them a little bit thicker. But the process of using a wide block as a blank, putting the round over on it before cutting the taper is the main point I'm trying to make with this whole exercise. If you're trying to get that wedge perfect so that it's flush on both sides at the same time when it's driven, that's wonderful, but it's probably going to be specific to one sanding belt. So there's a little bit of variety in there, but you can see on this older sanding block, the wedge stops short and that's typically that's the setup I like. That way I've got a clean shot on one side. It doesn't really matter that this extra wedge is sticking out on the other side, but if it was a problem, it could be just trimmed off. But then again, switching the belt, to this older sanding block. You can see that this belt is on the long side and all of a sudden the wedge behaves different. To make the other wedges I need out of this same blank, I'll just do the round over on these two three degree tapered sides and then use a square cut to cut the wedge to length. Depending how big of a batch of blocks you end up making, you can start out with a wider blank for making the wedges. As it is, I need to cut two more wedges out of this piece and it's getting kind of small. So I'm gonna use my method for cutting small parts safely by spraying a bit of CA glue activator on a scrap and then adding the glue itself to the edge of my wedge stock. And getting that little thing glued together before I go to the miter box to cut those three degree angles. And that way I've still got as many fingers as I started out with, plus two more wedges. To finish up the blocks, I took a quick lap around them with a sanding block of all things. To remove any splinters, pencil marks, glue residue, etc. The corners of the strip, take a little wipe with the sandpaper to knock down the sharp edge. And because of the sequence of cuts and planing, I don't have much sanding to do on these. And the Mercaderos with 150 grit Abernet disc polishes them up real nice. And you absolutely cannot beat the dexterity of the Daros for sanding things like these small pieces and especially smoothing up the round over end of these blocks. I tuned up each of the wedges by using a sharpened putty knife to remove saw marks and the sanding block to knock down the sharp edges. And the Daryl's sander is agile enough that it makes sanding even a small odd shaped part like this possible. For a finishing touch, I stamp each block 
with a steel letter and number set to indicate the grit that's going to go on the block before giving each block a light coat of beeswax to keep them clean in the shop environment. I fit each block with a corresponding belt grit and then found the best fit of the wedges for each belt. The variance in the belt lengths meant that in some cases I added a couple strips of this plastic strapping that's used for bundling lumber from the lumber yard. I just tape those on to the end of the block and then drove the wedge home. That way I can cut all the wedges so they stick out the same amount on this side and so that they don't stick out at all on the other side just by scribing them with a pencil. And I just marked how much needs to be cut off the other side to keep it from sticking out the block. And I take out the wedge, mark it for the grit, and then trim it to length with the rounded edge against the fence. And I'll take an extra blade width off the skinny end and cut to the line on the fat so that the wedge fits nicely for this block and this belt. In the future, if the belt is shorter or longer, I can adjust the wedge if it's enough to bother me. And I'll put a coat of beeswax on these blocks as a preservative finish. It's easy to put on, it's durable, it'll keep grime from the shop from soaking into the blocks, plus it makes them look real nice. And if you've never used beeswax before, it's a real treat. It just has a rich kind of woodworking smell to it. And the process is just set it and forget it. Swab some on there. Let it soak in, a little extra on the end grain. And after it's had a while to soak in, just kind of buff it down. No wax really stays on the surface because it, it soaks into the wood. And those wedges hold the sanding belt on here tightly enough that they won't ever slip because of putting a little bit of finish on them. This is about as low tack as you can get with a finish for application. But for durability and ease of application, it's tough to beat. I've given these parts about an hour in front of the wood stove. That just speeds up the cure time for the beeswax, soaks it into the open grain, just makes it pretty. And at this point, I just buff it down to kind of even it all out. It moves any excess down into the pores where it, the wood soaked it up a little bit more. Like I said before, if you've never used beeswax, you're in for a treat. It just has the fragrance of woodworking back before the days of all the sophisticated chemical finishes, which are wonderful in their own right, but, but once in a while it's just nice to go back to something that's about as natural as you can get. The Skidmore's beeswax has a few other things mixed into it. I'm not sure what or why, but the primary aroma is beeswax. It just smells so good. It gives the parts a nice sheen. I ended up stamping the numbers on the back of these wedges so that the marker marks wouldn't come off with the beeswax. I've got to remember that the 50 grit and the 100 grit belts were long, so I added those shims to the wedges. And I don't know about you, but I think I'd call that a complete set of the best blocks for demanding sanding. So, whether you make a whole batch of blocks or just a single sander, you can think of the time you spend making these as an investment that pays off every time you have a project that requires some demanding sanding. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up button. It's momentum from those likes that drive this channel forward in the eyes of the YouTube algorithm, and I appreciate it. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. Every time the subscriber count ticks up another thousand subscribers, it just provides energy and momentum for future growth and improvement in video quality and frequency. And anything you do in the way of sharing things from this channel that you find helpful or maybe even just entertaining helps spread the word and provide energy for going forward. I always appreciate viewer interaction through insightful and entertaining comments to these videos. It's rewarding to learn when something from a video has helped somebody do something new or faster or better. I'm currently working on a number of longer videos that show in-depth 
some of the processes and methods I used for making the parts of these box newels that you see in the shop during this video. So I hope you'll check out those videos when I get them uploaded. And in the meantime, work safely and thanks for watching.